of journalists, but I think also with uh, uh, streaming, people are following our meeting directly on the on the screen, and also to the webcasting and questions could also come after the meeting directly directly to you. As you know, at the WHO, you use very often, or Mrs. Chan is using always this technology for communication. So thanks again for being here, Professor Johannes van Delden, Dr. Hans-Jörg Heni, uh, Mrs. Uh, Marie-Paul Kenny, and Dr. Lemby Trego, uh, the moderator also of the, of the meeting. Uh, I think the, the topic is also important because uh, ethical guidelines uh, in the domain of the health is uh, quite important and uh, that's, uh, that's yes, good topics. Even uh, if it is not uh, really easy, easy to share with the public, with the media and so on, I think that's quite important to, to uh, mention and to think about that. So, before to give the floor to Dr. Rego, I would like to ask you to sign our golden book. Uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, and, and, and we need a pen. But uh, maybe you... <laughs> ah, yes. Ah. Okay. The golden book. Yeah. And I give you a little gift, a little souvenir. That's uh, cartoons we published uh, uh, in May with the cartooning for peace. Uh, just a souvenir for you, you know, to remember your... You just want the signature? Or yeah, also no, the no, name? no, just the name are there, that's okay. that's okay, so thanks. And do you have, the, where it's streamed, do you have the... the, the? If someone wants to follow the stream? Uh, ah, no, it's uh, directly on the screen on the, on, uh, okay. on the computer, yeah. It's pressclub.ch, hmm. pressclub.ch, but we announce when we make the invitation that hmm. they, they know they can follow on uh, the www.pressclub.ch. You, you can have a look and uh, you can see yourself. Just mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thanks. Dr. Rego, you have the floor. Uh, thank, thank you very much for welcoming us here. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce very shortly this uh, meeting we will have on the occasion of adopting by the Council for International Organizations of Medical Sciences Executive Committee today, on the 29th of November 2016, the new SIOMS, Council of International, for International Organizations of Medical Sciences, International Ethical Guidelines for Health-Related Research Involving Humans. We are all worried about the public health, and we are all worried how we could improve the public health. And while trying to improve the public health, it's quite obvious that you can't do it without doing the research. And while engaging in research, you have to deal with a lot of complex issues, among them also ethical principles according to which the research involving humans could be carried out. SEOMS has provided during many years very authoritative guidelines that have been helpful to many organizations and we are also proud that we have been working together very closely with the World Health Organization and with the World Medical Association. Without going more into the details, I think I would like to go just jumping to the business and it would be my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Marie Polkini the Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization, to give from the World Health Organization a short introductory perspective about the new ethical guidelines of SEOMS. Please. Thank you very much, um, Lembit. 
Um, dear colleagues, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at the launch of the SIOMS International Ethical Guidelines for Health-Related Research Involving Humans. <coughs> research is one of the six core functions of WHO, and we do this through shaping the research agenda and stimulating the generation, translation, and dissemination of valuable knowledge. As the directing and coordinating authority on health within the UN system, the World Health Organization attempts to support research around the world, mainly in low- and middle-income countries, and in communities and populations that are hard to reach, those that are the most disadvantaged, and those that are the most neglected. WHO also supports research in the context of disasters and epidemics, and in the recently released R&D blueprint for action to prevent epidemics is the latest strategy to support high-quality research and development for vaccines, drugs, diagnostics, and delivery systems in the midst of emergencies. It is in this context that I warmly welcome the latest update of the SIOMS International Ethical Guidelines for Health-Related Research Involving Humans. Researchers around the world are conducting research in a rapidly changing reality, a reality where more and more research is conducted in low- and middle-income countries, where research is also conducted during disasters and epidemics, where databases and biobanks that cross national boundaries are becoming the norm, and where researchers are embracing the digital medium without necessarily understanding all the ethical implications inherent to the use of these new technologies. The SIOMS guidelines respond to these changing realities and provide guidance not only to researchers, but also to members of research ethics committees. The guidance document identifies issues and offers solutions in a very balanced manner, especially for issues that are very thorny and contentious. Combining the guidance for biomedical and epidemiological research into the broad category of health-related research is a welcome step. Indeed, research projects are becoming more and more interdisciplinary, and compartmentalization of studies into biomedical and epidemiological seems artificial at this moment. The updated guidelines contain a bold statement in support of research on vulnerable people and population. By defining vulnerability not through black and white lenses, but by providing guidance to research ethics committees on how to analyze vulnerabilities within their context, I'm pleased to note that the guidance on children, women, and especially pregnant women is strengthened. It seeks to promote research on these under-researched groups, rather than just offering protecting them from harm and exploitation. While, of course, protection from harm is an important ethical principle, we have seen that overprotection often results in exclusion of these groups from research and from the fruits of research, even in situations where the research in question is very relevant to their needs. We saw this very clearly during the Ebola crisis, when sponsors did not allow their product to be tested in pregnant women, even though mortality in pregnant women was among the highest. This is also why we are missing so many medicines for children. In a world where privacy and confidentiality concerns can be seen to be an obstacle to health research, I am pleased to see that the SIOMS guidelines provide clear guidance on protecting privacy while supporting research. In the area of an increasingly digitalized world, these concerns become even more important, and the updated guidelines provide very useful explanations to researchers on how to protect privacy when using a digital medium for research purposes. Finally, I am particularly pleased for the opportunity to speak at the press briefing, because the process for developing these guidelines is in line with WHO's guidance on how to develop guidelines. SIOMS engaged from the very beginning with the Guidelines Review Committee of WHO. I understand that the update of the SIOMS guidelines are backed by systematic reviews on key issues and that the SIOMS working group that met 10 times over three years was truly representative. 
of the different regions of the world, of different expertise, experience and backgrounds, and was also truly independent. A special word of thanks to this exceptional group of experts, which, as I understand, put in an enormous amount of thought and energy in this work. The guidelines have also benefited from a wide peer review process, and all this gives me confidence that the guidelines will help researchers around the world. I congratulate SIOMS and its Secretariat for leading the work in this important area and for coordinating the process in such an exemplary manner. Dawecho is honoured to be associated with his guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for these kind words, Dr. Maripolkini. I think we are honoured to have this statement from you in support of our new guidelines. And, of course, we have tried to work with, with all the important partners. And another very important partner for us has been World Medical Association. As everybody, medical doctors all around the world, know what is Declaration of Helsinki. And we had to take care that what we do is as much as possible in harmony with what is the vision from the World Medical Association and also what is the principles, guiding principles of the Declaration of Helsinki. And I am honoured to have the representative in our working group, who was there also, uh, from the World Medical Association, to present shortly their views on the new guidelines. Please. Dear Dr. Lambit, uh, dear colleagues, thank you for inviting me. Um, actually, I had prepared a presentation. Can you show it up? Then I will stand up. Then. Should we go, maybe? We can, we can go. <coughs> so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Dr. Lambit has said, the relationship between the Declaration of Helsinki and the new science guideline is very important. So I have been using here in this presentation a current example to illustrate how the relation of these two guidelines could, could be conceived and in which sense there are really two complementary guidelines to the ethics of biomedical research which uh, represent the common approach. Now, this is a recent German newspaper headline. Dementia patients are going to be used as human guinea pigs. Of course, that wouldn't be very ethical. So what is, what is the background of this, this headline? The back background is not just a German debate, but an international debate. This is about the increase in dementia and the underlying diseases due to demographic change. And um, according to this, also the increase in, in the need to develop new medications. So on the one hand, we have the need to, re to adapt the existing drug law to these new requirements. And on the other hand, we have the necessity to protect dementia patients as a particularly vulnerable group. So there is, a, there is a contradiction between the vulnerability and the need for protection on the one hand, and on the other hand, the need for research. This is actually a, a conflict that is there in all situations of research. The contradiction between protection on the one hand and the need necessity of research on the other hand, and there is no easy solution to that. So, how does the Declaration of Helsinki address this problem? Here, I quoted um, paragraph 28 of the Declaration of Helsinki. I will not read it out, but basically the Declaration of Helsinki says that in a situation where such in a situation with dementia patients, it is not possible to obtain the informed consent from the participant in the trial, it is possible to obtain the consent from a legal representative. This is acceptable if the research is necessary to promote the health of the group which is involved in the clinical trial and represented by the participant. And if it cannot be done with other people who are capable of 
providing their informed consent. This is the so-called subsidiarity requirement. And if there is no more minim than minimal risk and burden to the trial participants. And of course, the Declaration of Helsinki also highlights that vulnerable uh, populations and individuals need a special protection. So far, Declaration of Helsinki. Now, this is the corresponding guideline of the new SIAMS guidelines. And already here you can see the difference. The SIAMS guidelines are much more detailed. They are much longer. And this is just the bold text, the so-called bold text, where the guidelines and principles as such are incorporated. Additional to the bold, there is also commentary. So this is guideline 16, and this is referring to the same problem as the paragraph 28 of the Declaration of Helsinki. Now, I will not go into the details, but these are, this is more or less a very brief summary of the principles that the science guideline put forward in the same situation where research participants are not capable of providing their informed consent. So you can see the same principles as in the Declaration of Helsinki. So there must be the consent of a legal representative. There must be minimal risk and burden. There is the need um, to carry out the research in this population. And of course, there is also the subsidiarity requirement that it cannot be done in other populations. But on additional, there are much more detailed requirement, additional conditions which can be met, which explain already how the guideline can be applied. I only highlight one point that there is the possibility of an advanced research directive. So in the case where somebody who knows in a very early stage of dementia that he will be progressing in the disease, there is the possibility that somebody um, formulates an advanced research directive that he or she wants to be involved in a particular trial regarding this disease at some later point when the person may not be lo longer capable to provide their informed consent. So that's, that's just one point which applies to our situation. So if we compare both guidelines, the Declaration of Helsinki is a concise set of general principles. It contains around 2,000 words. The science guidelines contain principles, justification, and furthermore, conditional applications, and much more specifications. So the science guidelines explain how the general principles which are contained in the Declaration of Helsinki can be more specified and can be applied to difficult situations, such as uh, research with dementia patients and they contain 50,000 words. So that, that illustrates the difference, what, what uh, the character of each guideline is. And both guidelines protect the right of individuals and groups. So that's their basic approach. And both guidelines appreciate the necessity of research, as can be seen um, in the example of the dementia patients. Both guidelines come to the same conclusion. Research is necessary. And at the same time, the participants have to be protected. And both guidelines strike an ethical balance between these two sort of possibly conflicting goals. So they are complementary in that sense. And it, on the one hand, it is necessary to have a brief document, such as the Declaration of Helsinki, where the principles are laid out in a readable, accessible, and short way. And on the other hand, it's also necessary to have a document such as the SIAMS guidelines where the principles are applied, specified, justified, and additional conditions are explained. So in that sense, I would say both documents are perfectly in accord with each other, are complementary to each other, and are really enriching and shaping the international debate on research ethics. And this can also be seen in the result of the German drug law, which came out of the discussion. And finally, the 
the German drug now, now allows research with dementia patients. And actually, on the same conditions as laid out by our two guidelines, which is no, that is no accident, the guidelines have been present in, in the debates in Germany as well. And I think that's a good example how both guidelines and the conditions, principles they bring forward can shape a national debate and the international debate. And are, I think they are representing the best competence in research ethics that we actually have. And I think that competence was also visible in the science group and in the discussions that uh, I was very happy to be involved. I learned a lot and I congratulate SIAMS to having these guidelines and having approved those guidelines which are really enriching the international debate on the ethics of biomedical research. Thank you. Uh, thank you Hans-Jörg for this excellent presentation and also making this very so to say, links to the real life, which are always very helpful, and real situations. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce next speaker, who will be Professor Hans van Delden, immediate past president of SIOMS. And also, if you are doing something, you could say, in the process, there are always, you know, sometimes somebody who is more a bit like a father and there's another one who is a bit like a mother. <laughs> and as usually you probably have those who are more having the father role a bit maybe more visible than those who have a bit a mother role. But I think I'm very happy that both of these persons are here and I would also like to, Rieke to stand up from the same institution as Hans because I think she was also very instrumental of doing these guidelines, and of course all the working group members. But now, it's really the great pleasure to, to give the word to the Hans, because I think he, he's the man who is behind the process long time. And now he can give some insight how the cooking went. <laughs> and that makes, me, that makes me the father or the mother. Um, Here, yeah. So, thank you very much for this introduction. Um, and, and thank you also to the previous speakers for these kind words about uh, the, the new guidelines. Um, I think it's, it's a good thing if, if I can say a little bit about the content and the process of how we got there, uh, because it has been a challenging process, um, but indeed I also think that it has have, uh, had a good result. Um, maybe just a, a, a very brief word about SEOMS itself. Um, because not everyone in this room may be familiar. SIOMS uh, is an abbreviation for the Council of International Organizations of Medical Sciences, and as such, we are a, um, an organization of organizations. So on the next slide, you'll see that we have only 44 members, which may not strike you as impressively uh, much, but of course, these members have thousands of members because they are the international organization of clinical pharmacology or pharmacovigilance of internal medicine. So these have really thousands of professionals uh, as their members, and we are an organization of their organizations. Um, we were created in 1949, both by WHO and UNESCO, and so we were part of that post-World War II uh, constellation of organizations that was created. Um, we have had guidelines for the conduct of research, medical research, that is, um, since the 70s, actually. That's when the work started. Um, and the previous version was the one from 2002. Um, and indeed, as Hans-Jörg also already show, showed, um, one of our features has always been that we had the guidance in, in bold, indeed, <laughs> and then a long commentary to explain um, what we meant. And actually, that has been an asset, because I agree, it, it, there's also a necessity for a short and, 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 and concise document, but some committees uh, really also profit from explanation and longer texts, and that's what we provide as well. Um, so at some point, um, notably five years ago, we said there are good reasons to revise the text of the then uh, existing guideline. And this was, of course, because a lot of things are happening in research, and I will get to that in a second. 
And when you embark on such a process, it's actually quite a challenge. Um, as, as the ADG of, of WHO already said, it was a very uh, balanced uh, group um, with, with many perspectives and groups and, and uh, backgrounds, which is, of course, a very valuable thing. Uh, and also very, very valuable was the collaboration with WHO. At, at several points, uh, and actually during all the meetings, we had uh, very valuable input from WHO, and I'm really very glad that we could have this memorandum of understanding um, by which we can still um, say, and, and rightly so say, that this was a document in collaboration with WHO. And I'm grateful for all the work that also APA uh, put into this, because this has been great. Um, well, it wasn't only WHO <coughs> uh, advising us, although WHO, of course, was a collaborator and not just an advisor. Uh, we also had uh, UNESCO and the World Medical Association, as you have noted, and CORET, which is the Council for Research in Developing Countries. Um, also very important is that if you, if you convene such a group and you start to meet and you start to work, um, at some point you need to open the windows again and, and tell the world what you've been doing and invite comments. That's the peer commentary that we went through. Um, we, of course, went to consultation meetings, but we also had this consultation on the website, uh, and we were able to, um, uh, to read both uh, Spanish and English comments, uh, which is also a good, good uh, feature, because that means that we really had different perspectives also in the commentary phase. Um, what we did is... Um, we, um, of course, opened up the, the draft in September 15. Uh, we uh, had half a year for people to, to respond. You may think that that is uh, a very long period, but actually it's not, because many of our commentaries uh, were actually delivered by groups of people who had to meet and then had to uh, reflect on the guidelines. Uh, and as Hans-Jörg already indicated, there was quite a, a lot of text to it, so this took a while. Um, but then, indeed, we got um, a lot of comments. Um, we adapted the text in, in various places, and that's why I can be confident that we now have uh, a result that, indeed, went through this process of peer review. Um, another thing that was already mentioned by uh, Marie-Paul Kini is the fact that um, ethics, to a certain extent, can also be evidence-based. Of course, not in the same way as when you develop a vaccine. I mean, that's, that's clear. Uh, but at the same time, it's not as if ethics has no origin whatsoever. Um, there have been, also within ethics, there are, there are empirical claims, and you can actually look at those. And also within ethics, there have been other discussions uh, that you can take on board. Um, so, no, ethics cannot be derived from facts, but yes, you can actually do uh, a lot of research uh, in order to strengthen the base of your guidelines. Um, so we did, did use these systematic literature searches uh, and we took the recent positions of others into account um, and we used all that to come to new reasoned positions uh, regarding uh, all the guidelines that we uh, changed. Now, as I said, the need for um, a revised guideline was the fact that the landscape changed. It's, it's no longer, um, the way we are doing research is no longer the same as we did uh, when this century started. Uh, I think a number of changes uh, can be named. I uh, listed here some. It's by no means uh, everything that could be listed, but these are points uh, that are, I think are most interesting. Um, the numbers behind these challenges refer to the guidelines. So if you wonder why I switch from one to, to seven, it's because in guideline seven we actually respond to that challenge. One challenge is um, that we now know, um, and, and famous epidemiologists have pointed to that, that a lot of research actually remains within the research domain and has a hard time in making it to the bedside. So there is a lot of research that never reaches where it should uh, uh, end up, and that is in healthcare, in real day-to-day -day, uh, practice. So we wanted to bridge what is called the valley of death in translational research. We wanted to make sure that what, what's done in research actually also can be relevant for patients, and that's the first challenge. Another challenge 
um, that is not new, of course, but needs to be met, is the fact that a lot of research is actually taking place uh, in low resource settings. And by the way, that word in itself uh, deserves some comments as well, and I'll get to that. Um, and interestingly, there also things are changing. One could say that maybe 20 years ago, the common pattern was rich countries sponsoring research um, and maybe doing the research in low resource settings. Nowadays, that may still be true, but at the same time, it's also very often true that research is actually initiated in low resource settings, and that creates a different relationship between the sponsor and the researcher altogether. So how to, to create conditions of doing fair research there was our challenge. Um, again, somewhat related to the first point I made, um, uh, there is this movement called science in transition in which you say, well, you cannot only do science uh, that answers the questions of scientists. You actually need to do science that also answers the questions of patients, of the public. So if you want to do relevant research and end up with relevant results, then indeed there should also be a process of public engagement because that is what you need to get to relevant research, uh, results. And then there is this gradual change, I think the last maybe 10 years, that you can really see that in the old days research was a project and it had a starting date and then three, four, five years later that was the end of that research project. Nowadays, what people tend to create are research infrastructures, databases, cohorts, biobanks, that will enable them to do a number of research projects in the future. So rather than having an informed consent process at the front door, do your project, end it all, write it up, send it off to a journal, which was history, we now have the creation of an infrastructure um, with a different possibility to give informed consent with different ways of interacting with those who contributed their, their material or their data to, to the, uh, the cohort or to the biobank. Uh, and so this, this really also demands a different approach uh, to research. Um, and again, and I think Hans-Jörg really neatly summarized that already. Um, of course, as, as probably you're aware, uh, research ethics was born in scandal, as we used to say, and, and of course we, we make the reference to World War II or maybe also to things like the Tuskegee trial or other trials that, that were um, done in the 50s, 60s and 70s where in hindsight we would say this is really not the way to do it. Um, so as a response, research ethics really has this protective, um, protective let's say, impetus and, and to, to really protect the uh, participant from the maleficent a researcher. But of course the result is that you get the protection but you're also um, unable to get any data on, on these uh, groups. It's exactly as hans Jörg said, we now have come to realize that if you keep protecting you're actually also low in protection because you will not know what, hap what happens. And this is very much the reality. Um, if we use pediatric drugs, usually we simply divide uh, what we would use normally for adults by six and say, well, children are about one-sixth of an adult, so let's use one-sixth of a dose. And that's, of course, not correct because their physiology is different. Uh, but we don't have the data. Uh, and the same is, is relevant for preg pregnant women. Uh, pregnant women can become ill and ill women can become pregnant. And if they do, we actually do not really know how to treat them because we don't have the data. We've always been protecting them and not including them in research, which was fair and which was understandable from this protection paradigm. But the result was, and is, and still is, um, that we don't have data. So we need to strike a new balance between protecting the participant and also ensuring that participants or the group that they represent can actually benefit from research. So, um, this is, in short, what, what I would like to comment on. Um, and of course, I do realize that I, I'm certainly not able to, to tell you the whole story and, 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 and tell you everything in the guidelines because that would take far too much. So in this talk, uh, this is just an a, um, overview of all the guidelines that we now have. There are 25. 
Uh, and in these 25 guidelines, there are several that I would like to highlight, and these are the ones that respond directly to um, the challenges that I just summed up. So this idea of making sure that whatever you do actually reach, reaches the bedside uh, prompted us to uh, put as a condition uh, social value. And so we now say that uh, it's really the scientific and social value, um, the prospect of generating knowledge that meet that and the means necessary to protect and promote people's health that really justifies doing research in the first place. Um, putting this up is, is relatively new um, and trying to explain uh, this is also relatively new. And so we have really created some, some new uh, domain, I would say, within research ethics by emphasizing this this criterion of social value so much. Um, of course, and here you again see this balance, um, it can never be that we say because of social value um, we can now forget about your human rights. Um, so of course, yes, we stress social value, but at the same time we say research has to be carried out in ways that uphold human rights and respect, protect and are fair to study participants and the communities in which research is conducted. Scientific and social value cannot legitimate subjects subjecting study participants or communities to mistreatment or injustice. So here you already see the tension that we have been talking about a bit already. Now, the second thing is um, that we felt a need to restructure the uh, criterion for doing research in low resource settings. And, and previously, this was called low and middle income countries. And you'll notice that we went from countries to settings. And this is because we have realized that in some previously called low and middle income countries, you can actually have a, dispar a, a wide variety of healthcare. In some parts, it will be absolutely fantastic, and in other parts, it might be actually quite poor. Uh, and the same goes for so-called very high-income countries, where uh, some regions actually um, are very low-resourced and have very limited possibilities, although the country as a whole um, might be a high-income country. And this prompted us to uh, no longer speak of low- and middle-income countries in this respect, um, but to opt for the term low-resource settings. And this can be within high-income countries, as I said. Um, the idea here is that if you want to do research in a low research setting, please make sure that some local, um, let's say, benefits are there, so that some local social value is accruing to that community. And in order for that to happen, you actually have to do research that is relevant for that population. So it has to be responsive to their situation. I mean, if you do something that is not relevant to them, how could ever the results um, be beneficial to them. So it has to be relevant, and that's our criterion of responsiveness. Um, and then, of course, it shouldn't just be relevant, uh, and then we go away and, and whatever benefits accrue to someone else. No, it has to be relevant, and the products, um, either knowledge or, let's say, an, a medical intervention, uh, need to be uh, made available as soon as possible, um, and also according to plans agreed beforehand. And indeed, we said additional benefits, such as investments in the local health infrastructure, uh, could also be provided um, if that's part of the plan. Because the idea is really to have research researchers um, uh, consult with communities in which research is to be carried out before the research starts um, and to set up a preferably a long-term relationship, because I think that's also part of our guideline, that we shouldn't work from case to case. Um, if we are working and creating these research infrastructures, we can also um, adopt long-standing relationships with these researchers in low- and middle-income countries or settings um, and make sure that uh, benefits do accrue to that uh, community. Well, I, I, again, I, and I've said it before, um, all these guidelines are fitting together, right? So it's not as if you can, you can take one and you have it all. You need to read the whole of it. Um, and one part of that um, puzzle is community engagement. And community engagement is, is a very popular theme. Um, actually, in some countries like mine, you cannot even uh, propose research without having some uh, patient or public involvement uh, in designing your research. Um, 
But often, all too often actually, that takes the form of having a one-time meeting with someone who is then regarded as the patient, um, and uh, you have consulted the patient, and you will continue with your, do, with your work, whatever, in the way that you had envisaged already. And that, for us, is not community engagement. For us, community engagement is, is a meaningful participatory process that involves patients or the public, that depends, of course, on the question, um, in an early and sustained manner. So not just in the development, but also in the implementation, the design of the informed consent process, monitoring of the research, and dissemination of its results. So again, long-term relationships, not just flying into to some situation, asking one patient, saying I've done it, check the box and go home and continue as you planned, but really um, aim for long-term relationship with, with communities. I already said something about <clears throat> um, the change that we can see from projects to infrastructures in research. I'm not saying that we don't no longer have projects. We, of course, still have research projects in, in medical science, but we also have a lot of um, um, infrastructures. And I think it's fair to say that, that in this era of big data, uh, data is the new currency in, in medicine. Um, it's very important um, that we collect these data. I think we can do a great good, uh, deal of good with them. We can create a lot of uh, uh, beneficial results for society. Uh, so I'm, I'm really very much um, um, in, in, in agreement with this development. At the same time, it does pose um, ethical challenges. Um, and one is, indeed, that if you create the um, infrastructure, you do not yet know what you will actually research. So you are creating the possibility to do research. You're not actually, at that very moment, doing the specific research project. Um, <clears throat> so later on, you will use the infrastructure to do the project itself, but you do not know, know that at the moment of collection of the data or the uh, biomaterial. And that prompted us to say, well, then we do need to also think, think differently about informed consent. This used to be a process in which you were fully informed about the specifics and, and every step of the research, uh, and then you could say yes or no, and then the research would be carried out. Uh, but now you can only be asked to consent to having your material in the bank or having your data in, in, in the uh, data bank. Um, and having it used in a later stage for a not yet known uh, purpose. And so we talked a lot about that and finally agreed on, on this term to say that if you can, of course, you can still use specific informed consent, but if it's for future use, then broad informed consent for unspecified future use can also be acceptable. This is an interesting term. Uh, broad informed consent, some will argue that it's maybe a misnomer. We deliberately put it this way because if you go to a restaurant this evening and you ask for the, the, the fish dish, you will probably also not know exactly what the chef put in. And so you also have, in a way, broad informed consent to have the fish dish, right? Um, you get fish, but the herbs that he used or the amount of white wine vinegar that he used or whatever um, is not specified to you. So that's sort of the analogy. You broadly know what it will be used for. It will be used for medical research. It will be used for this and that purposes. It will be used within this and this uh, infrastructure, but you do not know exactly what's going to happen. And of course, um, if you, you do this, um, then actually what you're doing is, um, let me see, uh, this is here, yeah. Um, broad consent or broad informed consent in a way is consent to governance. What you're consenting to is not this specific research project, is consenting that your material is used under these conditions. So broad consent is consent for governance and that idea is really central to this guideline. Um, we have adopted broad consent but we have also specified the um, let's say, the terms for proper governance. As you can say here, see here, it says proper governance, and that means that we indeed specify a lot of criteria for that. Now, there are much more detailed uh, guidelines here. I will not go over every, every detail of it, but one thing may be interesting to highlight, 
and uh, they said if if I went to um, uh, let's say conferences in Africa or in Asia and talked about this, the big worry was always um, what are they doing with our material? The worry was the material that you have collected is now taken out of the country, it's brought into a high-income country, uh, it's used there to maybe create something and, which is then patented. And so you have taken away our material and used it to earn money in your setting. This is sometimes referred to as biopiracy. And this biopiracy is really a big worry in, in many of the so-called low, low and middle income countries. And so we had to address that. And we had to say, if you create such an infrastructure, and if you create this governance structure through which you can actually um, use that in a, in a later stage for not yet specified research, uh, then make sure um, that people from representing the original setting from which the material was collected are also in that governance structure so that they feel that it's not just taken out of their hands um, and moved to some place where it used to make money, but that they can still control it. Uh, and if you're not using it, please um, bring it back. Return it to all material to the setting um, um, if, if it's no longer needed. Um, this was um, our answer to this idea of um, uh, biopiracy, if you want to call it that. Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm s switching from, from guideline to guideline and from issue and challenge to, to another issue and challenge. Um, <clears throat> and I already used the example of pregnant women um, as an example of a group that used to be um, uh, regarded as highly vulnerable and therefore was often excluded from research. And all of that is very understandable. Um, you, you um, of course, are familiar with the Softenon case or the thalidomide, thalidomide, how do you pronounce that in English, thalidomide uh, case um, at the end of the 50s. But of course, that is the perfect wrong example. It's perfectly wrong because if thalidomide had been researched, it might not have gone so much astray as it did. Because it was not the research, it was just over the counter sold to pregnant women, and that's how uh, all these uh, malformation uh, uh, came about. If we had done some research, we could have maybe, I'm not sure of course, but in retrospect, you could say that maybe we would have known what the effects of thalidomide had been. Um, so again, striking the balance between protection, um, protection as in refraining from research, and in a way also protection by having data that can be used to provide quality health care to you. Um, and so, indeed, as hans Jörg also already said, um, we started from the point that research would be good to have. Of course, not for getting protection, but that it's really relevant to have knowledge um, of, of how, let's say, drugs operate in, in pregnant women, and that this must be promoted. Uh, and then, of course, we had a number of conditions using the same toolbox, as you already explained, with respect to the demented patient, um, without any further, of course, similarity between the two, um, and <clears throat> indicating that risks must be minimized and that there must be the, protection, the, the potential of uh, individual benefit. And if that's not there, then it, the risks can only be minimal. Um, and also interesting. Um, we said, and this may be a bit, um, um, well, maybe challenging, but we said, um, if you do this kind of research, you can only do it in a setting where a safe and timely and legal abortion is possible. Because, of course, if you do run into a situation where side effects are found, and if the woman, therefore, no longer wants to keep the child, then, indeed, an abortion should be a possibility. This is, this is what we said. And this is also something where, where we have really uh, exchanged a lot of views with WHO about. Um, so I come to a conclusion. Um, in the end, we started with saying, oh, not everything needs to be changed. But in the end, of course, we ended up with changing almost everything. We are very grateful for the very constructive uh, collaboration with WHO. I think the process has been as transparent and as reasonable and as reasoned uh, and open as possible. Um, 
um, in a week from now, the new guidelines will be available on the website. We need to do the final adjustment, adjustments that, that were made today, uh, because of course today the guidelines were accepted by our General Assembly and that resulted in, in some minor changes that need to be uh, 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 made. And, and that's what we are going to do in, in these uh, the remaining days of this week. Um, and then December 6, we will have the, website, the, the guidelines on the website. And we do all this to keep the SEOMS guidelines a living document, ready to meet future challenges and based on thorough ethical reflection. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, let's now get speakers to the table and probably we can have some small Good discussion, following. Okay. Yes, very good. So please, if there are any questions, anybody has any anything to ask, you're more than welcome. No questions. I am asking one question from ourselves. What is about the other languages? Is it going to be available also in other languages? Ah. <coughs> um, yes, we're certainly aiming for that. Um, um, Spanish is, is a very um, good possibility and we already have some people who expressed uh, an interest in, in, in translating the guidelines into Spanish. As you will realize, of course, the whole South American continent speaks Spanish, of course, with the notable exception of Brazil. Um, <clears throat> and so it's very important that, uh, that indeed the guidelines will be translated. And French will, of course, be uh, our next aim. Um, given also the length of the uh, guidelines, this is a challenging process. Uh, and you do need to to be really careful because in translating from one language to another you might actually lose a lot of content uh, so it needs to be checked um, so this is not easy but it needs to be done um, as, as was indicated before these guidelines are meant to be used and are used by, um, by research ethics committees um, and research ethics committees sort of use this, this text as a, as, a, as a resource to really help them in assessing research projects that are brought to them. Um, and this will work all the better if it's done in, in their language. Now, of course, it will be impossible to translate it into every language uh, and certainly not to, to um, sort of uh, accredit all the, the translations that have been made. Um, but Spanish and French are on very high on our list to to uh, realize soon. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions, meanwhile? Yes, please. Oh. Introduce yourself and then the question. I'm Nicola Magrini, and the secretary of the Essential Medicine List. Um, I, I read an early draft and I provided some comment. Um, but uh, being um, here, I j let me try to have a discussion on. Uh, I saw you draft a carefully some statements around clinical research. Sometimes you mentioned randomization. You didn't put too much emphasis on it. Um, however, I think it's still a hot topic that also in emergency has been a very, very hot topic. And um, it was a difficult situation on how to advise. Of course, consent is the solution, but very often we say the solution to what? sometimes we feel had we randomized you know postdoc statement are always much easier so just uh, just a comment um, you're of course dragging me into the swamp here um, <clears throat> and, 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 and I applaud you for that um, I think it's fair to say that to a certain extent after the trials in the in the 90s uh, the discussion about placebo really went off like a big fire and at some point ran into a stalemate. Um, and 
If there's one guideline that we have not been able to fundamentally change, it would be the guideline on placebo control. So with respect to placebo control, um, and, and I think this is really also the situation for WMA, um, we are still in the same position, which means that you can do placebo control if there is no, um, well, proven effective is, is WMA language, we say established effective, never mind the differences. Um, but if there is no effective intervention available, you can do placebo. Um, you can even do placebo if withholding the known effective intervention uh, creates only minor uh, problems. And then we have moved a little bit by saying um, that we would allow a minor increase over minimal risk in these cases. And that's as far as we could get. Um, you will know, I, I, I assume, that in some countries, uh, to do placebo control trials outside of these conditions is forbidden by law. You may question whether it's wise to put such specific, um, <clears throat> let's say, rules into law, but that's the situation. So the debate on placebo-controlled trials is really, um, in, a, in a way, is blocked. And also our group has not been able to really make gigantic moves in that area. However, um, as I said, and, and I, I'm really convinced that this is the way that we are going, um, if, if you look at the innovations in medicine, drugs, yes, but also other things. Uh, and they go pretty fast. And a randomized clinical controlled trial will yield results in probably something like five, six, seven years from the design of the trial. Um, meaning that it's actually a quite low type of response to the challenges that healthcare put to you. Um, so without saying that we no longer need randomized clinical trials. We do. We do need randomized clinical trials if we want to, to, to study causal relationships between drugs and effects. Uh, but I think there is also a big room for other things than RCTs. Um, and of course, there will also be controls in that kind of studies. So in a way, it's, it's not as if we have fully uh, escaped from the problem. But I think the classic RCT is no longer, I would say, the one and only instrument that we can use to evaluate medicine. Yeah. Well, I would just continue from here because there is a recent, very interesting publication which was analyzing the recent approvals by the US FDA and European Medicines Agency, trying to figure out how many of the approvals are based on non randomized control clinical trials. And actually, there is quite a substantive amount of approvals that are based on non-randomized control clinical trials, exactly for the same reasoning that was brought by Hans, because they take enormous time, and the risks sometimes are, and the rapidly moving environment <coughs> has been putting forward other types of evidence that have been considered by the regulator and accepted. And I, I can give this coordinates of this article. It's an interesting reading because it's the research of a small group, <laughs> regulators and some very well-established academicians who have analyzed the situation. So things are not so any more entrenched than black and white. So there is movement into certain, there is a direction and movement into, into taking other types of evidence also as a basis of a regulatory decision. Any other questions? Then, yes, please, please. Um, when do you tell our drugs when they get to diseases Yes, the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> although, and, and you will be aware of that, I guess, the whole big data, um, let's say, hype, if it's that, um, um, is actually also blurring a couple of lines. And so what we are looking at is health-related research. 
um, well, some of, let's say, the big data that are collected are actually not collected within health-related research projects. They are collected by this thing, right? I mean, there's an app here with a heart that tells me how many pace, uh, uh, steps I made today, right? And that is collected somewhere. Um, so I think we've made a good step forward, but there will certainly need be a need for, for next steps. Because, um, yeah, I mean, it's also the Googles um, and the Amazons of this world that we need to get into our sphere of influence. At this moment, we are looking at the, the classical party parties, right? The medical researchers, uh, institutions such as, as the WHO, um, uh, let's say academia. Um, and these groups we can address and they sort of are willing to play according to these kind of rules. But there are also new players such as Google and Amazon um, who are not familiar with these kind of rules and who are actually quite certified uh, to tell you, you can use my app for free, but in return I get all your data. Um, and, and that kind of provision, I think is very unfair, needs to be addressed, but is at this moment beyond the scope of our guideline. So yes, we have moved into it, but no, we are certainly not the last word to be said about that issue. Thank you. Rodolfo, please. May, may I thank you? May I just uh, say one thing? I'm Rodolfo Saraci. I was I honored to be part of the of the working group, and uh, I think uh, I'm particularly representing the epidemiologists there. And in relation to this comment, I. Uh, last comment is not exactly the same point, but is a relevant point. Uh, <coughs> we get quite a lot of concern on the side of epidemiologists about uh, uh, use of, and connection of, between registries which are available, on the use whether really the guideline would uh, really represent an obstacle, I mean, to that. And I know because, I mean, in living every day among epidemiologists, I realized that sometimes there were hot reactions, even in respect to previous versions of the guideline, which sometimes were really, to my viewpoint, uh, not so justified. Now we have made broadly, remaining on what uh, Professor Vendel just said, remaining at this general level, we have introduced a real distinction between uh, registries not further qualified, for which there are a lot of uh, really precaution be taken, which are very well listed there. And then we made a small uh, uh, addition, which is, however, quite important for registries which enjoy the status of being mandatory because they have been recognized at different levels, at the ethical level and the governmental level, and they are mandatory. Those registries really can operate with special rules, and I mean, which really don't impede, for instance, a cancer registry or a malformation registry carry ordinary activity within the registry, though specific project needs obviously to be approved by ethics committee. So even there really we have advanced and reaching a balance between the need of the protection and the operability, I mean, of the tools that we have in hands. Thank you. And there was another. Yes, please introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Maribel Lucena from University of Malaga, um, representing IUFAR. Uh, are you planning to open this guideline to the scientific community, publishing that into a medical journal? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, <clears throat> next week, so December 6, we will also have a publication in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, they um, felt that CIOMS was a very authoritative uh, organization and that their guidelines were important enough to have an article in the JAMA, uh, which is very good, which we're very happy with. Um, and that will only be the first step. We are looking for further implementation of these new guidelines. Uh, we will certainly come up with a plan uh, and hopefully 
in collaboration with WHO, we will also be able to do some uh, workshops where we can uh, uh, introduce new guidelines, uh, maybe also with the help of regional officers or something like that. So we will work on an implementation plan, again, in collaboration with, with WHO. Yeah. Thank you. And I would add to that that during the executive committee meeting, we today also approved a small budget to support the implementation. So it, it, it's not that it's, uh, so to say, um, um, support without means. It's a support with means, which I hope will, will help a bit. And uh, I think our um, uh, immediate past president was also very generous, uh, promising something. I said, hmm, who, could go, who will do that? But he was more quick in saying that he will take the lead of trying to put the implementation plan together with stakeholders forward. So it was this time coming a bit inverse way. First the money was <laughs> earmarked and then the plan was coming to fulfill it. Any other questions, please? No? Uh, I think then we have still uh, a bit time here. There are some refreshments in the end of this room. So if there are no interventions from outside, because I think we tried a bit to get online if somebody is listening somewhere in the world and wants to ask questions, but apparently it, it has not taken place. So this means that then I can only have a very small role of thanking all our panelists. Many thanks and applause to them. And everybody is welcome to join for a little uh, informal discussions about this really landmark event and guidelines in the back of this room with some little refreshments. Thank you. <laughs>